On the third Thursday of every month, pastors and church leaders from near and far gather together for a time of friendship, gospel encouragement, and ministry insights in the warehouse at the Axis Church in downtown Nashville. The following is from one such third Thursday gathering. Well, I appreciate that uh, introduction. It's good to be with you. And what I'd like to do uh, by title, you've already heard it. I'll give you seven encouragements. It could have been six. It could have been eight. Seven is uh, just the number that I landed on. And in my preaching, I don't normally give lists, long lists like that. I keep my preaching to two or three points. But as this is a little bit more presenting than preaching, although everything I'm going to give you will preach, um, presentations can skip around some, presentations can meander, not sermons, sermons shouldn't do that. But I have seven encouragements for you. I'm going to give you nothing to do. I'm not going to engage any critique of the church or our vocation in it, just pure edification, I hope, is what this time will be, that you go away with something that's lifting and good for you. To start, I want to give you a thought or two on encouragement itself and why we need it and then give you the seven encouragements. I've got a nephew. My younger sister, uh, her son, uh, works ski patrol up at Big Sky in Montana. A really cool guy. Had a lot of cool experiences in life. Was a lifeguard in, at uh, Tybee Island before that. So he's gone from the beach to the mountains. And the last couple of months, uh, they've done avalanche training, which is very interesting how they do that. And then also they train rescue dogs. And so Johnny, my nephew, is part of this. And uh, he likes to volunteer to be the one that gets buried in the snow for the dogs to come find. And they will, they will dig out this uh, big crevice and he'll get down in there, his six foot six frame. And he'll get down in there and he'll send the family group me a video of himself waiting on the dog to come. And sometimes the dog, you know, starting to dig has found him and, and we all get claustrophobic uh, uh, watching that. Well, dogs have done that in high alpine reaches for centuries. And one breed in particular is iconic for this. You think of the St. Bernard. Uh, the imagery of St. Bernard's with the little keg on their collars due to, uh, this goes back uh, to the 17th century in the Swiss Alps. The dogs were sent out to find people lost in the mountains or buried in the snow. And the drink in the keg was meant to revive the spirits, lift the hopes of the survivor until the other rescuers arrived. And see, these thoughts I want to give you today are meant to be that drink uh, pardon the imagery if you don't like uh, dogs or drink, but whether you're in a snowbank or not, we all need encouragement. You don't have to be discouraged to need encouragement. It's valuable anytime we get it. And I don't mean this to sound uh, overly dramatic, but without encouragement, we die. It's a slow death. It's kind of like the death of oxygen deprivation. If our souls had a bloodstream, encouragement would be the oxygen that our bloodstream, soul bloodstream needs. And, and we can often deprive ourselves of encouragement. Usually it happens when we get absorbed with what's wrong around us or we get really ashamed over what's wrong with us. And we can then miss God's victory over everything that opposes him as well as his grace greater than all our sin. And so one of the things I want to establish with you here is that there's no such thing as too much encouragement. It's really not something that you can get too much of. And if you do feel snowed under by discouragement today, I can probably relate. I'm 55 years old now and I've had enough life experiences. Uh, thankfully, many of them have been great and good, but enough of them have been painful and uh, hard that I can probably relate to you if you're in a place of discouragement this morning. I can relate certainly as a pastor. I can relate certainly as a parent. Um, my oldest son, who's uh, almost 28, has been caught in severe uh, drug and alcohol addiction for about a decade now. The consequences of that have been everything. He's been homeless. He's been arrested in five states. He's been in jail. Um, He's had children out of wedlock. Um, 
He's been close to overdose uh, three separate occasions. His life is too chaotic for him to be involved in his son's lives. He has two little boys that are six and two. We are in their lives. We get to see our grandsons a lot. We thank God for that. But as his parents, my wife Lynn and I have certainly felt helpless. When you parent at whatever age uh, a child with addiction, you, you often feel helpless. And as a pastor, I've had times where I felt hopeless, particularly in the last church that I served for almost 20 years. Toward the end there, I found myself in some genuine no-win situations, and I started listening to the voices that were telling me I was losing. How do you lose no-win situations? They're no-win anyway. And um, in the deepest discouragement of of my life, uh, having lost a son in the way addiction takes someone from you though they live and then losing friends in the way that uh, scorched earth partisanship I would call it uh, takes friendships away from you and ruins ministry partnership I quit that long term pastorate with no other church to go to now of course we dignified that by calling it a resignation and it was a very dignified church and They wanted to be sure everybody understood this was God's purpose and calling in my life to move on, but in truth, I quit. It's the closest I'll ever come to knowing what a divorce feels like. Made it hard on myself to find new ministry, made it hard on my family to have to relocate after so long in one place. I have a lot of Nashville heritage. I was raised in North Alabama by Nashvillians, so my grandparents were here, and I've lived in the city a couple of previous times in my life, but Memphis is my children's hometown. That's their home. And uh, I asked two of them to leave that place and come uh, with us here, our two youngest. And um, I feel like I took that from them. Also my wife, uh, she was very happy there. Now pastorally, I had weathered hard seasons before. I church planted before I spent all those years in Memphis. I church planted in Murfreesboro, helped start the Fellowship Bible Church there about 25 years ago. Before that, I was in Franklin uh, back in the 90s. But, but I know spiritual leadership of God's people requires, as someone put it, the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the hide of a rhinoceros. Uh, parenting, too, for that matter. But discouragement, discouragements, plural, they're kind of like armor-piercing bullets. I'd never want to experience that. But uh, by analogy... Discouragements will penetrate our best defenses. There's really just no way to fence yourself off. Even if you chose isolation, (laughs) uh, you're going to experience the discouragement of that. Years ago, someone told me that discouragement is the devil's most effective weapon against us. And I think it makes total sense for a completely destructive being who wants to kill, steal, and destroy to use discouragement as his go-to weapon. Uh, He not all... He not only threatens to undo us, as Martin Luther said in his famous hymn, he often succeeds, temporally, but nonetheless. And if discouragement takes root, it will turn us inward in ways uh, that will believe lies and hyper-focus on what's wrong. Discouragement uh, just gets into our bones like uh, working yeast into bread dough. It, it just puts cynicism and despair into us. It, it is certainly baked into how Satan operates. And so, I don't know about you, but one of the things I've had to learn to do in my life is fight for joy. Sometimes it is a fight. You know, I never saw my oldest son's addiction coming. I personally discipled him. I followed the evangelical parenting playbook to a T, I thought. Uh, I sent him to great Christian camps, uh, sent him to great Christian schools. I asked when he was a senior in high school, four very godly men, very successful guys to mentor him. And they were happy to do that. And he was happy to receive that from them. Uh, All of this, he has told us he appreciated. He doesn't fault his upbringing. He doesn't say we were overbearing or that we were too much. And he's trying to, you know, throw that off. Um, He doesn't say that. But if his addiction journey has taught me anything, it's that the illusion of control, the illusion of controlling outcomes is just that. It is an illusion. I mean, it's a comforting illusion, and we love it, but it's an illusion. Children are God's gift to break us of that illusion, that you have control over anybody's life. Um, Because parenting is not programming. 
you know, programming you can control. Programming you can fix. You can go in and deal with the bugs and make it better. But we don't know what's going to happen to us or those we love. Even if we do a lot of things right, we don't know what's around the next bend in life. We don't know what unasked for assignment God will task us with. And if I've learned anything in the years I've walked with God, he will give you some unasked for assignments. And he has purposes in that. But I have to fight for joy. Uh, because I want to keep cynicism, um, which is unresolved discouragement, I, I want to keep that at bay. And I don't want despair to take root. And you may have never known despair. I, I hope you don't. It's a very dark place. It's, it's Mordor. <laughs> uh, the encouragement God gives is kind of like that little file of Galadriel, if you know your Lord of the Rings lore. Yeah. The little starlight vial that she gave the hobbits and said, you're going to need this when you find yourselves in darkness which they did because they left the Shire. We all have to leave our Shires in this line of work. Uh, we all have to leave our Shires at some point in life and face the darkness. And the Bible's really honest about this. It's one of the things I appreciate about the Bible as I read through it each year. Um, the Bible's honest, so honest, about the prevalence of darkness and that darkness's days are limited but also that we're going to encounter it, that, that pain is going to come to us. You don't have to go looking for it. I'll cite Paul as an example. Second Corinthians, I was just in a, the well coffee shop around Lipscomb yesterday meeting a young man who's new to our church. And the baseball team for Lipscomb was in there, a bunch of the guys. I think they were the baseball team. They, they, they looked at and what was on their shirts and all. And one of them was putting his coffee mug up as I put mine up and... Uh, I said, he has Bible. And I said, hey, what are, you, what are you studying? I'm a pastor. And, and we just had a little chit chat there about 2 Corinthians. That's what he was reading. He said, actually, we're all just kind of doing our own thing, but we all come here and have coffee and do our own thing together. So well, that's, that's a way of doing community. That's great. And um, 2 Corinthians is a fascinating book because uh, there's, there's two places where Paul lists <laughs> all the things he suffered. Uh, like chapter 6. He says, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Um, three times in chapter 11, he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. He doesn't mean the cannabis sense. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea. I was at sea for a, a period in March and uh, thought about that. Just looking out over the blue Caribbean and thinking Paul was adrift a night and a day at sea. It scares me to death to think about that. And this guy kept going. There's more detail in both chapter 6 and 11 of 2 Corinthians of all he suffered, but if anybody has reason to be discouraged, it's someone who suffers those kinds of things repeatedly and undeservedly, and he knows it. He's not just going through it once. He's going through it a plurality of times. Even in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, uh, Paul said he despaired of life itself. There it is. The apostle to the Gentiles despaired of life itself. 2 Corinthians 1.8. And what I think took place in Paul with that in response, he got really serious about encouragement. He became an encouragement hound. Some of, his most en some of the most encouraging things we believe as Christians come from his pen. Because he knew despair himself. He wanted to keep us from sinking in it, keep us going with God. I uh, recently listened to a podcast. It was an interview with Amy Grant. And she was remembering back to the time she met Billy Graham, famous 20th century evangelist. She was scheduled to sing at one of his evangelistic events. And she had not met him. And she was having a crisis of conscience as she told her story on this podcast because she knew that she and her, hus her husband at the time were headed to divorce and she knew that she was uh, not faultless in it. And she felt like uh, she knew that Dr. Graham you know, had had this long-term ministry without any scandal and she thought, well, I just should tell him. And so she meets Dr. Graham for the first time and... She tells him what's going on and, you know, basically says, if you don't want me to sing, 
as a result of this, I won't. Because this is going to hit the news, and, and I don't want you to be sullied by this. And Graham listened, and she said he began to talk about his kids. Uh, told her he had a lot of children. He and Ruth had five. That's how many Lynn and I have. And he said a couple of them, she said his exact words were, are taking the long way home. But, he continued, we're all going to get there, and it's okay. And she didn't take his okay as some kind of indulgence of her actions, but that Billy Graham could see past that to the person who right there before him needed to know Jesus still had good purposes for her. And he wanted to be part of that. And that blessed her so deeply. She still remembers it. And I've been praying, ever since listening to that podcast, I've been praying that God would make me more like that. You know, not in the interest of some kind of sloppy agape, you know. But to bless people like that, to leave that, that substance, that residue in people's life of blessing. Because we're all going to get home. It's true. Long way around or not, be encouraged. At his father's funeral in 2018, Leif Peterson said his dad, Eugene, translator of the message, writer of many books that have blessed a lot of us, including me. I feel like I'm a, something of a Eugene Peterson disciple. Eugene would often come to Leif's room when Leif was at home as a child. And uh, when he thought Leif was asleep, and most of the time he was, but a few times he was awake, and he knew what his dad spoke over him. Four sentences. This is what was said at the funeral of Eugene Peterson. Leif said, my dad would come into my room, and he would speak four sentences over me. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming after you. He is relentless. Now, I was just going to give you seven encouragements. That's 11. So we're going to add those four uh, to it. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming after you. He is relentless. Don't we need that playlist on repeat? And if we need it, how much more are people? Because they are really buffeted. I mean, we think about these things as ministers. I think our people don't as often, and they come to church so hopeful for a word of encouragement. Some, some lifeline. God loves you. May that never become more yada yada to us or too simple as if there's some greater truth we should graduate to that the God of the universe loves us. God is on your side. He's not a reluctant Savior. He is coming after you as opposed to coming at us. And he is relentless, inexhaustible in grace, new mercies every single morning and many afternoons too. Got a couple in our church who I was texting. I finished a run. I, I go running down from our church as the uh, Richland uh, Greenway. And sometimes I'll think about people in our church and I'll text them at the end of the run. And uh, I had not talked to this couple in a while and I knew they were having some, some troubles. And, and so I texted them and, and said, uh, how's it going? And they came back and they said, it's so, it's so good. Uh, we've both got great jobs now. We're sorry we didn't tell you, but you know, we've been busy getting these jobs and we're pregnant with our second child. And we just enjoyed that and texted back and forth with them. A lot of fun. Just four o'clock the next morning, I have a text. We're in the ER. We're miscarrying. So I've been texting them ever since. And, um, you know, just feel for them. Uh, had tears for them. And, and one of the things I tried to tell them and just giving them encouragement is that... Um, May the, may the mercies of God that are new every morning be new in this hour, be new in this afternoon you're in, be new in this evening that you're in. And they were there Sunday. They came. And they just, they just held each other in the corner and just cried. People are dying for encouragement. We're going through hard, hard things. And, and you know, optimism isn't going to cut it. Um, I was given a word coined by the writer Neil Plantinga. He, he talked about a hoptimist. Here's how he wrote about it. He says, uh, this is Neil Plantinga's words in a devotional he wrote called Beyond Doubt. Let's not confuse optimism with biblical hope. Optimism says, don't worry, it may not happen. Hope says, it may happen, but God will keep us. Optimism says, things will become better. Hope says, by God's grace, we will become better and better able to deal with trouble. 
Optimism says, cheer up. Hope says, look up. Your redemption is drawing near. Optimism looks like encouragement the way cubic zirconia looks like diamond. Uh, because in optimism, we tell ourselves what we want to hear. We tell ourselves what we want to be true. It can even be a form of lying to ourselves, well-intentioned, but nonetheless, a lie. The encouragement of God, by contrast, is hope optimistic because it's based on what God says to us. It's based on what God has done for us. And, and when you look at Scripture, particularly the Psalms, this is all through the Psalms, Psalm 42 is one that we're all familiar with. Twice in Psalm 42, the psalmist asks himself, why am I so downcast? And twice, each time, he tells himself, hope in God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the famous uh, Welsh preacher in London for kind of the middle third of the 20th century, used to observe that we spend too much time listening to ourselves when we should talk to ourselves more. He said, uh, we listen to our fear, we listen to our shame. He wrote about this in a book called Spiritual Depression. We listen to our fear, we listen to our shame, we listen to our anxieties, we listen to our disappointments and discouragements. And, and apart from whatever clinical reasons there may be for that, Lloyd-Jones was actually a medical doctor, trained as a medical doctor. Um, why we're downcast is that we're often listening to our inner murmur, our inner murmurings and complaints which can even trend over towards self-loathing sometimes. But to counter that murmur, Lloyd-Jones says, we have to tell ourselves, we have to talk to ourselves about the best things we know about God. Because those best things we know about God are for us. God has revealed them to us so that we can know how he thinks about us. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves and we have to believe it. Uh, Brendan Manning he used to ask, do you believe the God of Jesus loves you as you are and not as you ought to be? What a question. And I say, Lord, I do. I believe. But then the next sentence is usually, help my unbelief, because <laughs> I have all this other stuff that I wrestle with. And so I, I find the encouragement of God, it goes to work in us much more like a song than a sermon. Um, there's a book by David Taylor on the Psalms called Open and Unafraid. And Bono of U2, my favorite band of all time, that dates me, but uh, here I am. Um, Bono wrote the afterward to David Taylor's book on the Psalms. And in Bono's words, he says, listening to gospel-centered music, here's what Bono says, is a step of faith because while you might not be feeling so good about the world, around you or about your personal circumstance, you begin to sing the gospel song in the belief that it will take you to a new place, the one you need to get to. And that place we need to get to is the very place the gospel takes us, resting in who God is for us, what God thinks of us, acting on what God has done for us, trusting God to be everything that he's promised to be for us in Jesus. And so, Without further ado, seven encouragements. Just a few thoughts for each one. I'm, I'm aware of the time. Encouragement being a song. Encouragement being what's ever in the keg on the collar of the rescue dog God sends out to find us when we're stuck and revive our hope. Lift our downcast soul. Encouragement is a gift of grace. The stuff of starlight and that little vial that shines God's victory on everything that opposes him, including my sin. Encouragement as the antidote to the venom of despair. Encouragement that breaks the teeth of Satan and dispels the darkness that he frequents. So here's seven encouragements for us. Compliments of Jesus Christ. Number one, we are loved with a love that raises the dead. It's not any kind of love we're loved with. It's not mere sentiment. It's not God's affectionate feelings. It is a love that raises the dead. I, th I think this is what Paul meant when he calls us in Romans 8 more than conquerors. I think that's what that means in that context. Your love with the love that raises the dead. Uh, Jonathan Edwards once uh, summarized Romans 8 in three sentences. Uh, all our good things cannot be taken away. All our bad things will pass and all our best things are yet to come. All our good things cannot be taken away. All our bad things will pass. All our good things are yet to come. Why? Because we're loved with a love that raises the dead. You and I in Christ are loved with a love incorruptible 
that will not let us go. I hope that's wind in your sails. I hope that's solid ground under your feet. I need that truth to reseal my heart and my mind repeatedly. Uh, Frederick Beekner once wrote that the gospel turns commands into promises. And his example was, you shall love the Lord your God. As a command, I should love God. But as a promise, I shall love God. Not as an achievement in and of myself, but in response to his achievements to, for me through Jesus. That's what the Bible's getting at, I think, when it says we love because he first loved us. We are love of the love that raises the dead, the first encouragement. And not just that we're love, that would be enough on its own, but the love of God, again, it's not sentiment, it's inalterable, unconquerable. It cannot be spoiled. It cannot be taken away from us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us. I love the NIV's rendering of that, has lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. And I love the understatedness of that conclusion. And so we are. It's kind of like in Genesis when you get the creation account and it says, and he made the stars also. Oh, right. Yeah, the stars. He made those too. They're there because of him. Thanks. God's love is not a complicated doctrine. But we are complicated. We are complex. We're walking contradictions. We're mysteries to ourselves. We're our own worst enemies. So our feelings are going to ebb and flow, and we're going to go through circumstances and situations that confound us and confuse us. How could God love me and let this happen to me? And we carry all this shame over our sin. You know, how could God love me after I did that? But God knows what he's doing. God does not begin to love, hit obstacles, then quit. It's not like God shimmies out on a branch and then, oh, it can't hold my weight, you know. His, does, he doesn't second guess his love. If it was sentiment, if it was just feeling, he could. He could turn it off. But he is love. As Peter Kreft wrote about it, God is love the same way water is wet. Water cannot get wet. It is wet. And God is love. And he fixes his love on us. It's overwhelming. A second encouragement. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Now, of course, I'm quoting directly there, 2 Timothy 2.13. And that's not the whole verse. The verse says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And then it adds, for he cannot deny himself. That's amazing. The gospel is the assurance of God's fidelity toward us, not, not ours toward him, but his toward us, come what may. I draw so much encouragement from that verse. And not because I somehow epitomize Faithlessness. It would be, it would be um, insincere to try to act like I do. But, but I have my times and my ways of faithlessness. We all do. Every one of us lead with a limp in our respective leadership capacities. And, and so it's not just a matter of if we are faithless. It's when. But he remains faithful. The staying power of that word remains. This is one of the best things I know. And it just gets better with age and life experience and time. A third encouragement. We can do nothing, not one single thing, to reduce the joy God experiences in his own being. We can do nothing, not one single thing, to reduce the experience of joy God has in his own being. I base this on Psalm 16. Verse 11, you make, your, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What's that saying? That's telling us the joy God experiences, Father, Son, and Spirit, the eternal community of the persons in one being, three persons in one being. The joy God experiences in his own being is never reduced by anything. My sin doesn't give God a bad day. Whatever it means to grieve the Spirit of God, and there's biblical evidence of God's emotional pain, the point stands that the joy God experiences in his own person, Father, Son, and Spirit, is never in jeopardy as a result of something I do or don't. And I'm glad for that. We know what sin is. It's the human propensity to muck things up. 
It's the crack in everything. It's the evil we do and the good we don't do. Sin is a hard heart and a stiff neck. It's the vandalism of all God made good. As Augustine put it uh, very memorably, sin is disordered love. We love the wrong things. We love the right things the wrong ways. That's all sin. And we're not strangers to sin. It's, it's our nature. And though I am sinful, I can do nothing. I emphasize not one single thing to reduce the joy God experiences in his own being. And I just find that incredibly encouraging to know that God is like that, that God is never out of reach of his own joy. He doesn't have the angels there to pick him up. <laughs> he is an eternal community within his own being of joy. I can lessen my experience of his goodness by choosing sin, but he will remain always, eternally, full of joy. And that's a really good thing to contemplate. So there's three encouragements. A fourth one. No one can do anything to us that cancels what God has promised to be for us in Christ. People can screw with us. They can mess our lives up in some, you know, effective ways, sure. But no one can do anything to us that cancels what God has promised to be for us in Christ. No accusation, no attack. It can damage us. It can hurt us. Uh, no weapon formed against us shall prosper, as Isaiah puts it. A lot of hard things can happen to us. God's goodness to us means none of us have to fear God giving us what's bad for us. Uh, that's very different from saying God will never let bad things happen to us. You and I might wish to make that our encouragement. That's not the encouragement. The, encourage, the encouragement is God never gives us what's bad for us. God never gives us what's bad for us. If God allows it, if God sends it, he has a good purpose. That's what we believe. Now, people will. People will do all kinds of things to us. And we live in particularly graceless days. We live in unforgiving times. It, it, it feels in some ways like cancel culture is a little bit on the wane. It's still uh, out there, but people have started to recognize you, you can't hold things over people uh, eternally. You can't dredge up something somebody did 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, people are starting to get that. But when you think about how cancel culture has worked, you know, somebody wanting to hold something over or against you in perpetuity. It's like a T-Rex. You don't want to fall into the jaws of that, no, but those little arms are nothing to fear, you know? <laughs> By which I mean uh, the reach of what people can do to us at their worst is actually quite limited. If you fall into their jaws, they can chomp you. But if they come at you with their little T-Rex arms... <laughs> They just can't do that much. If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, I can't tell you how good that is to know, especially when you've been in the jaws, especially when you've been cast down on the mat, and you're asking, Lord, I don't think I can go on. I don't think I can get up. I don't think I can put myself back together. And you find that he does, because no one can do anything to us that cancels what God has promised to be for us in Christ. Very encouraging. Number five of seven, what God thinks of us matters most. What God thinks of us matters most. Now, this is a, a harder one to remember because we live virtually imprisoned by others' assessments and opinions and evaluations of us. We're all dealing with this. Or um, we're always comparing ourselves. You know, if we, if we get in the bad habit, it is a bad habit of comparing ourselves to others and we come up short then we always feel, you know, the deficit of that. We feel on the downside of these kinds of things. Writer Anne Lamott, Anne's a mess theologically, but I like her writing. She wrote, everyone is screwed up, broken, clingy, and scared. Even the people who seem to have it together, they are much more like you than you would believe, so try not to compare your insides to their outsides. Isn't that good? That's why I read Anne Lamont. She's a, I mean, she's a mess theologically, but she has so many great insights and has blessed me many times over. I think I'd really like her if I could meet her in person. Now, of course, some people can and will turn what God thinks of me matters most into a bludgeon. We've seen that. 
into a kind of relational cudgel, you know, and recklessness where you don't care what people think. You know, why should I care what people think? We were talking about this earlier. You know, I only care what the Lord thinks. Well, this shouldn't make us reckless. What God thinks of me matters most. It shouldn't make us reckless. This encouragement should make us rest. And the rest is that none of us have to prove ourselves to God or prove ourselves to others for, for that matter. You don't have to try to be something you're not. Uh, certainly not for God. I mean, he's not asking that of us. He gives us the gift of total acceptance due to his loving us first, giving himself for us. This is the gospel. I love Galatians 2.20. It's one of the first verses I ever memorized. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And what's interesting about the tense of that, the past tense, loved me. Jesus loves us now, but it's phrased, loved me and gave himself for me. He loves me now because he loved me then. So his love is, again, not a feeling. It's a securing. It lasts. There is no end to it. There was really no beginning to it. I mean... We have to have in our finite minds some beginning point, but somehow in eternity past, when Father, Son, and Spirit decided that they were going to make a world and they were going to permit it to fall into sin and they were going to redeem people from every tribe and tongue and nation from it, and somehow the glory God gets at the end of time is all the better for letting the world go like it does, which we don't understand, but we have to trust Him with. The love was there already. The love for you, the love for me. That's amazing to think about. A friend texted yesterday morning. I woke up to it. Um, a friend in Memphis uh, texted a little screenshot. He'll sometimes send me these just screenshots of verses. And his uh, screenshot was um, Psalm 40, verse 17. Psalm 40 is a very meaningful verse for my family because the, it's the psalm we prayed for our son Caleb. He even has it tattooed on the inside of his arm. It looks like it says extra large, but it's the Roman numeral for 40. And he has that there to remind himself uh, in all his darkness that his parents pray this because my son was a musician before the addiction hit, and the thing we had in common was we both loved you too. He loved his dad's band. And so we had a, a thing for Bono. And so uh, you two recorded Psalm 40 on their war album in 1983, and, and my son and I really enjoyed that. And so it was natural to pray Psalm 40 for him. I waited patiently for the Lord, for the Lord to hear my cry and to bring me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay. You know, a pit uh, in uh, the Old Testament is um, something uh, that you were cast in. Uh, a bog was something you put yourself in. Addiction is both end. It's something you're cast in and it's something you put yourself in. So it's an appropriate verse to pray. So John Campbell, my friend in Memphis, sends me this text yesterday morning early. And um, it's just a screenshot of Psalm 4017. And Psalm 4017 says, uh, Yet I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. And John said, Isn't it an awesome thing that the God of the universe takes thought for you? Uh, yeah, that really is. That's a great way to start the day. That's the fifth encouragement. What God thinks of us matters most. Two more. God is always doing more than we know. This is number six. God is always doing more than we know. When it comes down to it, I have a very limited vision. I have a very limited capacity for endurance. I have a very limited perspective. I don't always know how to account for what is going on or why something is going on, or why something I think I need from God is not going on. And, uh, and in the lives of those I pastor and care for too, this couple I just mentioned that I think about them on an afternoon and I text them and we're enjoying this good stuff in their life and the next morning, miscarriage. Oh Lord, I, I don't follow. I don't follow. I don't get it. Well, life unfolds more like a story than a philosophy. There's a writer named Lisa Finn who wrote these words. When you're in the middle of a story, it isn't a story at all. She said, when you're in the middle of the story, it isn't a story at all. It's confusion. It's darkness. It's a lingering ache in the gut. It stabs to the chest. 
It's a feeling of being swept up in a reckless current with no boat, no life jacket, and no indication of whether you are headed for calmer waters or a deeper abyss. It's only afterward when we tell someone else these experiences that it becomes anything like a story at all. That encourages me. I don't know what God is doing with some current life circumstances I have. Things are pretty good right now. Two years in at the Gospel Church, church is growing. I just married off a daughter two weekends ago. I've got another daughter about to get engaged. She doesn't know what's coming, but uh, the groom's parents are flying us down to Florida. All expenses paid so we can watch this happen. We can watch their son ask her on the beach. These are cool, fun things. I love that I get to see my kids and my grandkids as much as I do. But still, I, I don't know why some other painful and disappointing things are, are in my life right now like they are, and they are. I just have to trust that God is doing more than I know. And when the chapter breaks come as the story unfolds, by chapter breaks I mean points and places where you feel like maybe I start to get a little perspective, you know, on what happened. I'm three years out of my church in Memphis. I think I have a lot of good perspective now on what happened, things I couldn't see at the time. I'll tell you that story another time. But maybe at those chapter break points you start to see, you start to sense maybe what God is doing in those times that I can't see so well. Though he doesn't owe me an explanation. He doesn't owe me a perspective. But I believe God is always doing more than we know, and this encourages me. Final encouragement. Number seven. God is our home. God is our home. This gets at the particular blessing and encouragement of our adoption by him. Um, I happen to be an adoptive father. My youngest son, now 17, high school student here, uh, we adopted him at two months. And um, after our first four were born from us, uh, Colson, Cole's son, Colson, uh, was born to us. And I'm even an adoptive grandfather. Now, this is an unofficial process, but my youngest grandson, born last October, is not blood related to me. He is the third son of my older son, the one in addiction's ex-girlfriend, with whom he had two boys. And she's become like a daughter to us, the ex-girlfriend. We've basically adopted her into our family. And so the youngest son that she had with the guy she's with now, who we really like, and as we've got to know, he's my grandson. When she told us that she was pregnant, she actually told my wife on our back deck uh, last Easter, she said, I'm pregnant with John's baby. And Lynn just looked at her and said, well, I hope we get to be this child's grandparents too. Pops and Lolly are our names, Lollipops. That's the joke when you see Lynn is she, Lolly stands for little old lady. Lynn doesn't look like a little old lady. So uh, that's the fun part of that. So we're Lolly and Pops. And she said, I hope we get to be Lolly and Pops to this baby too. And Megan said, that's, that's what I was hoping to hear. And our oldest daughter, who, who just got married uh, two weeks ago, but had two children with her fiancé, looked at Megan and said, See, Megan, I told you mom and dad would be there for you. And so Fletcher doesn't have my blood, but my youngest son doesn't have my blood. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And so Fletcher is um, my grandson, and, and his dad's dad is dead. And his mom's dad is hardly ever involved in her life. So I'm the only grandfather who ever have. And I love him like I love his brothers. Psalm 68 has been a go-to verse in our adoption journey. The Lord places the solitary in homes. And we just said, Lord, let us, let us, let us do that. And he did. He hadn't done that with a lot of prayers I've prayed. Lord, let me do that. No. Let me bring some people now. Okay, you can do that. Adoption is the highest privilege the gospel offers. J.I. Packer said that. Theologian from yesterday, he wrote a lot about adoption as the centerpiece of New Testament theology. Here's his quote, and then I'll wrap it up. Packer says, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, 
it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. Adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven, brought in for supper, and given the family name. To be right with God the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. Isn't that good? Packer wrote that if he only had three words to summarize the message of the New Testament, it would be adoption through propitiation. Now, propitiation, of course, a pricey theological word. We use that with a lot of care, lest our people think we're always a cut above pew level in our, in our thinking. But it does unpack for us that word, the beauty and the, the incredible wonder that the wrath of God against sin God's considered hatred of all that has spoiled what he made good, all that has marred his good designs. His wrath is completely justified, but it's also completely satisfied. Instead of wrath, there's peace. Instead of getting what we deserve, there's grace. Instead of lostness, there's love. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most encouraging thing in the world. Let's thank him. Uh, Lord, we are grateful that uh, we can take some moments here on a Thursday lunch hour to think encouraging thoughts. There's enough that discourages us, and we may hit dirt discouragements soon after walking out of the door today. We may have things waiting on us this afternoon, this evening, hard conversations, difficult circumstances, just things that are right now dark, and we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know based on what you've told us, that you're with us to the very end of the age. And so, Lord, we, we want to be encouraged people. And so uh, the things about this that have been encouraging, Lord, keep in mind the things that need to fade and pass would fade and pass. Uh, thank you for each one of these, your servants, the respective places we serve, that you would give us wisdom and integrity and humility in all things and that we would be good servants of Christ Jesus in our generation and they would bring glory to you for you alone are worthy and we thank you for bringing us in on this glory project that you have going on in Jesus name we pray amen